very much. So if I'm not holding the mic properly or you can't hear me, please just say something um, and I'll try to do my best to uh, correct it. Um, and trying to figure out what to say, I did a lot of research about what you should do for a presentation. And uh, uh, a lot. Uh, this one particular book stood out and it said, uh, give facts and figures. You want to, uh, to postulate theorems and stuff and then actually prove them. Uh, you really want to minimize your personal story. <laughs> and um, I am sorry to, uh, to let you know that this is all going to be my personal story. <laughs> so um, it's going to go on a little bit long. I'll try to, to talk fast where I can. Um, but I'm going to try to tell you everything I know, essentially. Um, and I'm also going to tell you uh, why design is so awesome. <laughs> um, I'm going to do this through a variety of ways. I'm going to talk about my inspiration growing up. Um, I'm going to go through my experience and work. I'm going to go off on some tangents. Um, we're going to go through a little series of snapshots, but it won't be like a slideshow from a vacation. Um, and then I'm going to give you some tips to close out the day. So anyway, hi. Uh, my name is Chris Glass. And when people ask me what I do, I say as little, little as possible, um, which is, is kind of a, a play on words. Um, but it really is a goal. But the reality is I'm a designer. I like to make things. Um, most folks know me for t-shirts, um, but I also spend my days making icons and logos and apps and websites. And uh, I take photos every day. And I've also started to, to make videos. Now, how I ended up doing all of this is anybody's guess. Um, but I think the best way for me to, to tell you is to start from the beginning. Um, I was born and raised in New Richmond, Ohio, which is about 30 minutes from where you're sitting right now. Um, also, you'll note that I'll be using as many slide transitions as possible, um, <laughs> just to make it fun for you and me. Anyway, New Richmond is a small river town. Um, we have a couple stoplights, uh, La Rosa is a big boy, um, but it was a really great place to grow up. And there with my family, um, we had a farm. <clears throat> That's me. That's, that's before the beard. Um, but essentially, we had a farm, and we were surrounded by nothing. Um, there wasn't a lot to do, so we had to entertain ourselves. Um, my dad was a machinist by trade. He had a, a company that he started, and they built things for other companies, like Cincinnati Millicron and all this stuff. But he was also a nerd. Um, and he was funny, and he liked cars, and I, I got that from him. Now, my mom, she's actually right here today. Hi, Mom. Um, <laughs> um, I always remembered her and know her as someone that's always making stuff. She has got a paintbrush in her hand, or she's pressing paper, or she's in the garden. She's always making stuff. So we had this very creative household. And for me, it started with crayons. Um, you know, at the beginning, here's my uh, drawing of Johnny Bench, you know. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. And uh, I thought that, you know, I had a, a knack at this. So I wanted to be an artist. And because of this, and because I had awesome parents, um, my mom started taking me to the art academy on Saturdays. And that's where I would do classes. And, you know, I would learn how to do stipple and cross-hatching and even printmaking. But the best part of this experience was actually after the classes were over, after all the sessions, we would go to the museum bookstore. And I fell in love with this particular book by Ed Emberley. So essentially, this is a rudimentary drawing book that if you can draw these shapes, you can draw anything. And it was amazing. I mean, turning into this book and just opening it up um, you know, whatever I had in my mind, I could start to create stories. 
and um, I don't know, just imagine things, and all of a sudden it wasn't uh, insurmountable. You could just break things down and learn how to draw them. It was very basic stuff, but it was really important growing up. You know, this whole idea of breaking things down and building them up, you know, resurged again throughout my childhood. And it wasn't until, oh gosh, I guess age eight, when I started going to movies, that I, I didn't want to be an artist anymore. I wanted to be a puppeteer. Um, and this is the slowest transition ever. <laughs> so I really just wanted to emphasize that. Um, after that, I wanted to be uh, work in the movies. Um, but the reality was, I really wanted to be E.T. <laughs> um, and thanks to McCall's pattern 8311 and my mom, I actually became E.T. <laughs> in fact, she had to link them. <laughs> She actually had to lengthen the pattern to make the world's tallest ET at Halloween <laughs> that year. So um, the periods be between 1979 and 1983, all I wanted to do was pilot the Millennium Falcon and ride a speeder bike. Um, it, was, uh, it was a pretty important time growing up, but what I wasn't prepared for what was to come next, which was instead of being passive and watching these things on the screen, I was able to control them. And the Nintendo was released. Uh, I was 14 at the time, I was there right at the beginning, and I was glued to the television set. I sat too close, um, and I looked at every single pixel of how this thing was made, and I really started to evaluate, you know, how is this um, ha possible? This is the most amazing thing ever. And so my love with, you know, kind of interface and design and interaction um, was born. And I have to say on a tangent, you know, you can brag about your smartphones and waving in the air and all that stuff, but this is the best interface ever made. <laughs> um, so it was during this period of time where I saw these pixels that I started to draw on grid paper, and I just began to copy things. And it was a really important part of uh, just kind of experiencing life and, and understanding what it is they wanted to be in a visual way. So in high school, music came out, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm, you know, copying all of the the band names on the front of these CDs and singles, and you know, um, just really trying to understand type and color and you know, just fun stuff like that. I eventually started to do it on my own, where I would take my own concepts and uh, just doodle during math class. In fact, you can see that uh, that little part right there. That's drool. <laughs> uh, coming down the side. So uh, in high school, I wrote a paper that what I wanted to be when I grew up. And it wasn't very good. I think I got a B on it. But I wanted to be a commercial artist. So I went to Ohio State. Thanks. Um, so I went to Ohio State. And uh, it was on the first day there that I met this chick named Wendy. And she would uh, become a really important person in my life who's still around today. Um, but essentially, she was enrolled in an art class. And she said, you need to come into this art class instead of the one you're in because you're not being challenged. So I hopped over, and I joined Art 101 with her. And we had this teacher named Mike Origo that changed the way that I see. And essentially, on the first day of class, he said, fill in your entire paper with charcoal. And then he projected this image on a wall. And he said, OK, use your erasers and your charcoal, and I want you to draw what you see. And I thought he was crazy. Um, but then he's like, OK, you know, charcoal down. I'm going to focus a little bit more. So he did. And he did this after another five minutes each time. So it became more and more sharp. But what I learned from this process was, much like at Emberley, if you squint, you can start to see the shapes, and you turn off your mind from what you think you see. And so you're able to draw. And it's a really important technique. And I don't think that art is the domain of any one particular person. Anyone can learn this. And this is a really great tool to do that. So anyway, I uh, entered into the uh, design program at Ohio State. And uh, the, here's the long term of it, Bachelor of Science in Industrial Design with a focus in visual communication. It's a big fancy way of saying you're a graphic designer. But the beauty of this, and it, well, it, it was at the time, and it's not to this day, 
Um, it, was, it was a Bachelor of Science. It wasn't a Bachelor of Arts at the time. And I thought that was beautiful because, first of all, it took the load off of being an artist. This was a science that I could do, that I could learn. Um, and what I learned there in my time there was that design is a process. And it's a process that you can solve challenges. Um, there's a million different design processes. This is the one that I started with. You define something. You come up with ideas. You pick an idea. You make it. You analyze it, and then you repeat. It's just a looping thing that you do. And ultimately, at the end, you get a product of some, something that was from your imagination. You can pretty much reduce this down to define problems and make stuff. Keep doing it over and over. So, you know, sometimes the problems aren't always challenging. Sometimes it's make a letter, cut out of paper, and use an animal, or make a book cover, or make a logo. But it's the process nonetheless. Uh, during this time, I also went over to Switzerland to study. And although I had a, a particular angle on design, it started to evolve a little bit. And I became enamored with the Swiss idea of minimal design really trying to reduce elements down and to see how you can communicate with as little as possible. And I was a big fan of it. I closed up my tenure at Ohio State making a CD-ROM. Um, you know, they were really teaching us uh, how to make uh, letterhead and business cards, but I was intrigued by the screen. Uh, we didn't have a class for this, so I learned on my own using, I think it was MacroMind Director, but I cobbled it together and I was like, I like CD-ROMs. This is the hotness. And I graduated, and I had one goal in life, and that was to work as little as possible. Um, and I got a job making CD-ROMs. And all of a sudden, my weekends became this toolbar. Uh, but it wasn't work. It was pure joy. You know, I hadn't had a computer up until this point in my life, and now I had one, thanks to my boss, Robert Abbott. And I worked tirelessly. And we made a lot of CD-ROMs. Um, it, it was really interesting to, to you know, learn from him in the real world experience and hear him talk to clients on the phone and really justify things. Like um, the arc of those buttons resemble a spine of a book. And it's those little touches that make design better is when you think through things and you can describe them. Some people call that semantics. Um, but really, the uh, less fancy way of saying that is to make things meaningful. And it was, uh, uh, it was a new concept for me. And it was something that really stuck, and I really appreciate him for that. And one of the last projects I worked on was the CD-ROM for the National Museum of American Art. And it started to introduce uh, another element that would become prevalent in my work a little bit later on, which is to make stuff by hand. So when you see these columns on this interface for the menu, I actually just printed those off on a laser printer and cut them out and took a photo. So it was this blending of you know, physical stuff and digital that started to form um, kind of how I, uh, how, I, how I made. But then something happened. Um, CD-ROMs weren't as exciting. And the reason was this thing started called the internet. And I was blown away. All of a sudden, I didn't have to deliver something that would be stuck on a CD-ROM forever. But it would be something that could live and breathe and change. So all of a sudden, now I wanted to make websites. That was my goal in life. So I moved back to Cincinnati, and with my friend Heather, we bought this book. Um, we, formed a, we formed a company. Um, we went through all of the steps. And you know, as silly as these books aren't as awful to, as the covers are, they're really valuable for thinking about what does it take to make a company. You have to write a business plan. You, know, you have to think about the costs. You have to think about how much you're going to bring in. Um, there's a lot of businessy stuff. Um, and so we started a company. We didn't have a, a name by the end of the, uh, when it was time to register. So we just copied the front of the book, The Idiot's Guide to Starting Your Own Business. We even used their logo. And uh, we came up with Idio Technology Studios. And being you know, responsible entrepreneurs, one of the first things we did was we got health care. And so on my initial visit with my new family doctor, um, things got a little bit heavy. Uh, so yeah, uh, um, I found out that I had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, and it was kind of uh, you know, scary. 
So it was uh, a period of time in which uh, we had to stage the disease and find out where it was. And we determined that it was aggressive and indolent, meaning it had progressed quite far, um, but it was slow growing. So at the time, there was really nothing to do about it. I could go through chemotherapy and radiation, or I could just wait until I was symptomatic. And because I love to procrastinate, um, I said, let's wait. And I'm proud to say that it has been uh, 16 years, and I've never gone through treatment. Um, my oncologist says I'm his greatest success story by doing nothing. <laughs> um, but this whole experience, you know, right at the beginning of trying to start a company making websites, you know, it really gave, you, gave me a lot of perspective. And um, it made, really made me want to, to focus on things that matter. And, you know, I don't think that you have to have a diagnosis um, to have this realization. Um, these events in life vary wildly for everyone, but they lend perspective. You know, maybe it's a family person that um, falls ill, or it's a friend that faces a challenge, or even if you have kids, it doesn't have to be negative at all. Um, but it lends this perspective to help evaluate what is truly important. And so what do we do with perspective? You know, um, how do we move forward? And for me, it was really thinking about design again. Uh, it was thinking about my work and how to move forward. And what's beautiful about design is it's not this, um, it's, it's not for the creative, it's for everyone. And it's not just to make a button or to choose a font. It's a process that you can apply to any problem in your life. So I began, it, began in earnest. And uh, since I wanted to have a company and make websites, I learned HTML. And one of the first things I did was just kind of a, a cathartic process for me is I made a personal website. I kind of wanted to put a stake in the ground or plant a flag that said I existed. I made stuff and I'm really proud of it. Um, that website led to another. And that website led to another. Now this particular design was for a, um, a contest for Sun Microsystems. And uh, it was a lot of different people were were involved, but they chose our design. And through this process, I met this character, at least virtually, named Jacob Nielsen. And he taught me usability, which is, you know, design is not about you. It's about the user. It's about how they approach something and what they get away from it. It's not necessarily your personal playground. And this was instrumental in, in how I approached things going forward. It was no longer this very you know, selfish thing. It was a, an open process that everyone was involved with. Uh, usability was everything. So I made a lot of websites. Um, you'll notice some of these from Cincinnati. And uh, did it for, oh gosh, about 10 years or so. Um, and then something happened again. It's, it, it, it was good this time, seriously. <laughs> um, but maybe it was fatigue, I'm not sure. Um, or the fact that websites never really seemed finished. You know, pixels just degrade, clients go in there and muck with stuff. You know, it's like all of a sudden, all the stuff you're making, it doesn't feel like the thing you made anymore. So it was time for something new. So Wendy, who I met back in college, married this character named Tom. So he's somewhere around here. Um, here's, a, here's a better picture of him. So, Tom and I, we both loved music, and we both loved design, and uh, we, uh, we bought a screen printing press. And we did this on the side of our day jobs. This was just something for fun. Um, we had no idea what we were doing, and we just started mixing inks and destroying clothing and you know, whatever we could possibly do. We just kept doing it. We started in the basement of his house, him and Wendy's house, and we just kept failing, essentially. And we failed a lot. And eventually, one day, we finally got four colors to line up, and we made a print. At this point, we had run out of t-shirts, so we started printing <laughs> on any wood that we could find around the office. So we actually got a little bit better at it. And we decided, hey, let's make a go of this. Let's make a website. So we did. Literally, we made a website by hand. And uh, on December 7th, 2006, we launched Wire and Twine with exactly seven products. We wanted to make products that were different than other companies that were do, making uh, t-shirts at the time. We wanted them to be positive and to have a message that wasn't snarky. We wanted them to be about things that we love and enjoy and 
you know, we, we, we have fun with. So one of the uh, first designs was this flourish, which was kind of a tongue-in-cheek about everything had a flourish on it. Um, but it was also kind of a verb, flourish in life and do things. Um, the next thing I made was a, a T-shirt about beards, which was way ahead of its time at the time. Um, I should probably reprint that. I'm not sure. Um, but it had a key in the bottom, which beard was what. You know, um, we did silly stuff. You know, uh, simple messages on a T-shirt that would brighten your day. The we had just come out. Project Runway had started. Um, but, you know, starting to think about things that I love, I started to write down the neighborhoods of Cincinnati. And putting them on paper, um, it started to kind of form a mental image of, you know, a place that I love. And that was how the transit map for optimists was born. So it was a really fun time. And our shirts started selling. So we had to move out of the basement. And we moved over to the studio, moving all of the woodworking equipment out and the music stuff. And we just took over. And we continue to make shirts. Now, a lot of them are about Cincinnati. But it is a place that we love. And uh, it does keep getting like a heck of a lot better, I have to say. Um, here's, a, here's one that you see a, a little bit. And it was, it's really popular on onesies. Um, you know, some, some ideas are just born from silly things on the internet. But it's, 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 it's fun. And it's not client work. And it doesn't degrade over time. You know, these are not pixels that fade. This is ink that's adhered to a shirt, hopefully, permanently. Um, so we sell a lot of stuff around town, mica and park and vine and fabricate. Um, and uh, we've been doing it for seven years. And we're still figuring it out. We don't know all of the uh, ins and outs, but I think we're getting better at it. In the meantime, I mentioned the uh, at Emberley. I posted about this, um, my love for this drawing book for children online at some point. And it was about the time that we had made the 50 Ways to Help the Planet shirt, which had all of these different icons that were all about really easy ways to, you know, kind of treat the earth a little bit more kindly. And uh, it uh, struck a note with a character up in Chicago that worked at Mode Project uh, named Steve. And he really liked that stuff. He really liked Ed Emberley. And uh, you might know Mode Project for another project they did which was the Obama logo. Anyway, he wrote me and he said, hey, I'm working with the Obama administration on this American Reinvest Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act, and we need some help. We have four days, and we need a, an emblem to represent this program that's going to give America a bunch of money to hopefully spur economic development and kind of right the spiral that we were in. Would you like to help? And uh, I said, yeah, that would be awesome. Um, I can't believe this. Uh, so uh, I worked in conjunction with this character named Draplin, who you guys might know. Um, and he is an excellent partner to have on your team. And uh, I kind of owe him, I don't know, a lot of inspiration through the years. So it was, it was really an honor to just kind of be working with him. Essentially, like with any project, though, you, you just delve right in. There was no time to think. Uh, we just had to make. So the first thing is you research. You know, We have this very rich history of design in America, and they, we wanted to cull from that and develop something. Now, Aaron was off doing uh, eagles and stars and stripes and kind of Americana, and they, they told me to do this, uh, do an icon direction. So I started throwing out sketches to have uh, to, to, to kind of represent energy, education, healthcare, and jobs. And this is the one that resonated. And they said, and eh, make it red and put it in a circle. And that's what ended up. Um, and I still kind of don't believe it to this day that the next day I see this appear <laughs> in the New York Times. I don't think Joe Biden can believe it either. Um, it's a... Uh, you know, it, it is a little unfortunate that, you know, the, the, one of the, 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 the feathers in my cap is the thing that you see when you're driving down the highway and there's construction. So it's not a very pleasant experience always when you see this emblem. Um, and it's not always pleasant when you see the backlash that uh, other people might have when they see the emblem. So it was one of the most uh, divisive things I've ever done. Um, but give me time. Uh, so... Yeah. 
I'm not going to look at that too much. Um, <laughs> you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion and be, um, you know, uh, gung ho about something. And I'll have to say, for the people that made this, at least they made something. At least they didn't just say to somebody, "I think your idea is bad." They came up with something new. And I think that government, when they come up with something, you know, when they come up with ideas, you know, it's it's not a bad thing. You can't just poo-poo everything. You just have to, you know, come up with some. Give me something. Anyway, so it was really hard actually to see all of this stuff go down, but I learned to let it go. You know, once you put something out there in the world, it's it's still just yours. You know, all of that work in the process. You know, that's what you need to know. So I like to think that this emblem represents a really awesome process, a great idea from an administration, and it culminated in that. Um, so the thing I learned, you know, uh, I didn't learn, I just always keep making. Um, so I keep making uh, logos, and uh, I really have a lot of fun with it. It's just a great way to, um, I think there's another slow transition <laughs> here. I saw that at 3 a.m. and I was like, I gotta stop that, and I didn't do it. You know, sometimes it's all silly fun. Um, <laughs> that's my friend Chad in St. Louis. He posed for that and sent me the picture. And uh, that's Bubba. Anyway, I have friends that have a, a dentistry office, and they needed a, a logo. Um, I do stuff for schools. I do things for local groups. Um, you know, I think it's important to really have a, a diverse set of things that you do. It's not always one thing or another. Um, somehow I met up with this character named uh, Chris Hardwick and helped him do his identity. Um, and then he started blowing up and he had all these podcasts, so we started to do that. And then I think it was, you know, maybe eight years, I don't know, seven, I can't do math. Some years into it, we were like, hey, why aren't Twine needs a logo? So we finally made one of those. Um, so it's a little W and T, or it's a tree. You know, we thought that was kind of fun. Um, and I still make websites. You know, I meet some really great characters while doing it. Um, Merlin Mann was a, kind of a, a really instrumental person in kind of sharing my work and letting others see it. Uh, we worked with uh, Waxy here in Cincinnati, which was one of my favorite jobs. And what was kind of funny about that is all of a sudden it felt like being in high school again when we made the T-shirts because we were just drawing band logos day in and day out. But I do try these days to make things a little bit more meaningful. I like to work on projects that um, help people or um, at the very least help us create a better community. Um, it's not always about helping people though. Sometimes it's about working with people that you really dig, people that are nice. Um, you know, it really goes a long way uh, with how we treat each other. Um, so. Websites, websites, websites. Um, but it's important every once in a while to take a break again, you know, to not do these pixels all the time and to use your hands. So one of the next projects that I worked on, um, I actually went to Michael's and I bought some cardboard letters and uh, my friends needed an album cover and we went through all of these different iterations and we couldn't figure it out but it wasn't until I put all of these things together they were like, wow, we, we hit it, we, we, we should do this. So we actually made this and then we printed them by hand and it was a really great project. Um, you know, along with you know, sharing my favorite books from childhood, I also like to share the love online. And if you go to my website, um, I have this whole section in the middle where there are links to things that I find interesting. And I'll be honest, I do it just for me. Um, everything's organized because I have a really poor memory, um, but it's a way for me to remember gifts to buy for friends or something to do with CSS or JavaScript or something nerdy, or it's just something that's really inspiring. But because of this, um, I met this lady uh, named Tina, and you guys might know her as Swiss Miss. And we kind of became virtual friends for a while, and so I I went up to New York and I actually met her and I'm going to kind of break the camera and the wall here and kind of look at the camera. Uh, we're standing here today because of her. So thank you, Tina, for making Creative Mornings and uh, uh, thank you for letting us bring it to Cincinnati. I think it is something awesome and it's an honor. So uh, Tina asked me, hey, I'm starting this thing up uh, called Tatley. Will you, will you make a, 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 ta a tattoo, a temporary tattoo? 
And so I'm like, yeah, sure, naturally. I mean, I'm not sure what I would get a tattoo of, but it would probably include my mom. So thank you, mom. You are um, my anchor. Um, so when you have these things that you love, you know, put it out there. Eventually, you're going to find like-minded people, and they're going to help you further along in your journey and your path. Now, there's one project that I do, and I do it daily, but I don't get paid for it. And it's something that I love, and it's daily photos. Um, so in 2003, uh, I took a photo so I could remember what to, to write in my virtual journal about. I was on live journal at the time. Um, and so I took a picture of this gas pump because I'm really freaky, and I don't like the numbers on the gas pump to line up. And I thought, OK, this is OCD. I should really share this with the world. Um, so I did. Um, but I found through this process, it was really easy to just take a picture and remember what to, to write about. And I found that I really like to make with the camera. And it's not some complicated thing. You know, there's uh, an art critic named Jörg Kohlberg that said, when you look at what is commonly called fine art photography, it always comes with a statement, which typically, typically contains some sort of explanation or motivation to the photography. You know, you never see something like, I just wanted to take some beautiful photos. And that's really all I want to do. And actually, they don't even have to be beautiful. I just want to take photos to represent each day. So I've been doing it since 2003, and I've taken quite a few. Um, so I, I forget where this was, but I was on one of those little things going over the beach, and she was there, and it just had to happen. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I, I, I take a lot of photos, but don't get me wrong, some days are really mundane, um, but some days are kick butt. You, know, you, you really don't know. I mean, you really don't know. Um, this is Golden Corral. You know, I don't take a lot of pictures of myself, um, but what I find kind of uh, funny or ironic or interesting, I'm not sure. You know, I'm in every photo. I see it in the subject matter. I see it in the smiles of the people I'm looking at. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's present. And uh, you know, it's not always you know, immediately uh, visible. So what do I take photos of? Um, I take photos of cats. It's hidden in, up in there. And dogs, and trees, and cars, and signs. And if you haven't been to the New American Sign Museum here in Cincinnati, you are missing out. It is awesome. It's incredible. Um, get this guided tour with Todd. It's, uh, it's well worth your time, and it's quite lovely. Um, I also take pictures of barns and things in bathrooms, like these free. <laughs> I guess you saw the free cowboy hat dispenser. Um, I love music. Uh, I take pictures of music. And sometimes I take pictures of things, and I have no idea why. Um, but the process is pretty simple. I keep my camera set to automatic, P mode, I believe it is. Um, I avoid using the flash. Um, and then I use the rule of thirds, which if you're not familiar, divide the photo up into thirds and put something on the lines or in the middle of the lines, bam, you've got art. Um, but the reality is I just center everything. And there's a reason I do this. It's because I can just take a picture and move on. I don't have to think about it. Uh, it's just a way to just engage and disengage and uh, enjoy. So there's a few things that I've learned by taking photos. And one is from my friend Anne, who's also here. You know, I, I once asked her, I'm like, Anne, you're always busy. How do you do it? Aren't you exhausted? It's crazy. And, and you know, she's like, it's easy. You just say yes. And she's like, well, and I, I'm, I can't paraphrase it, but she's like, if you stop saying yes, people aren't going to ask you anymore. But the important thing is to say yes. So I started saying yes. And I ended up in places that I never thought I would, you know, just being kind of, oh, I'm doing my job. And anyway, so I, I ended up saying yes, and I, I went places. Um, I end up uh, going every year for a month, and I live off the grid in California just because somebody asked me. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. That sounds fun. Sometimes I regret saying yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's probably hard to tell. Everybody has a beard, but I'm the lady in the red. <laughs> um, so another thing that I learned, and this is a really... A good photo for that is to ignore feedback. 
Um, if, you're, if you're counting your, your photography on how many likes you're getting on Facebook, you're doing it wrong. It's not for that. It's for you. It's for those that you love, and really that's enough. And they might communicate that in different ways, so don't rely too much on the type of feedback that you might get. Another thing I learned is to not stress about it. You know, I'm doing this for fun, and although there are rules that I have, taking a picture to represent each day, if I miss out, I'll just take another picture the next day to represent the day before. So it really doesn't matter. Always carry a camera. The beauty of now is we all have cameras um, with our phones. Uh, another thing that I, I learned just by carrying a camera all the time is to just be a tourist in your own city. And I think we're really lucky to have such a fine city that's growing in Cincinnati. And what I've found by taking these photos is that when I look back on the photos from each day and I reflect about, about the good parts, you know, I sleep better. Um, it's uh, a really wonderful thing and I recommend it to anyone. So, I said I was going to give you some tips, so here are some helpful things that I've learned over the years. And the first is to graze. Um, you know, this is uh, from uh, Gordon McKenzie. He presented this, and it stuck with me all these years. And essentially, when cows are performing the miracle of turning grass into milk, um, it represents the creative process a little bit. So if we draw a line to represent that creative process, you know, just at the end when they're making milk and they're in the, uh, the barn uh, hooked up to the milking machine, you know, their productivity is tangible at that moment. But the earlier, larger part of where they're chewing their cud and grazing in the field and thinking about stuff, that's the thing. You know, this is, um, it might seem like they're being idle, but it's the alchemy of transforming milk. So we really have to honor grazing. And we have to allow time without immediate concrete evidence of productivity for the miracle of creativity to occur. And it's a beautiful thing to just kind of justify all that surfing you do on Facebook. So um, this book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball by Gordon McKenzie, it's filled with fascinating, fun little stories like that. And um, I really dig it. Another thing that I uh, experienced and read about and it kind of stuck with me was how you can work backwards. Um, and this is Amazon's process for coming up with a new product. Um, but essentially, when they have uh, a new product coming down the pipe, the first thing they start with is the press release. And what this does, it allows them to focus on the customer, and uh, it allows them to kind of clear up the terms from the customer perspective. What is the benefit from this? And it becomes the map for all of development to make something. And I think that that's something that you can do with anything in life. You know, you just visualize your desired future in tangible ways. So, like right now, um, I'm visualizing a beer. So, it, uh, it's just a really helpful tool, if you will. You know, speaking of helpful tools, uh, I see this a lot in business right now, and I don't have specific data on this, but I feel it has merit. And especially in, in today's climate where statistics make decisions for you. So if you ever get this in a meeting and people are like, oh, statistically you should be doing this or that, there are no metrics for awesome. And uh, that's all there is to say about that. Uh, if you ever get in a bind, and I know I do every once in a while, usually about every four weeks, and you're feeling heavy, you know, just go out and um, get a haircut. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a great way to step away from your desk, which if it's getting messy, that's another problem that I found that, you know, you just clean your desk. And here's a fun way to do it. Um, you can take everything on your wall that you've been collecting that's inspired you, and you can put it together in a decoupage. Um, <laughs> you know, you keep it tidy, and you can reduce the clutter. Um, I reduce clutter a lot in my life. Um, sometimes I take it too far. Um, I don't like to see the pill bottles in their designs because they don't match. Um, anyway, uh, you know, here's another thing that I just learned recently, um, and it was, I, I've, I have a mountain bike, and I've had one in college for years, but I never took one off-road. And I finally did with a friend, and, you know, I was just looking down at the tires, and he's like, stop that. You need to look forward. Um, if you're constantly looking too, far, too close in front of you, you're just adjusting yourself too quickly. But if you look forward, you can kind of guide yourself naturally 
um, and propel yourself forward. So it's a really great way to really approach a lot of different things. So I'm like, hmm, you know, I should look up more often. This is pretty good. So uh, another thing is uh, if you find shoes you really, really like, just go ahead and get three pairs. <laughs> you know, um, there's no shame in it at all. Um, and, you know, one of the last things is uh, don't wait. You know, if you want to write a book or learn how to cook or paint or bike a distance, there's never been a better time than now to do that. Um, and it's not just because we have the Internet to distribute your work, but we have the Internet to learn. And it's a really fantastic time. You don't have to wait for that album cover to drop in your lap to design it. You can actually just go ahead and make that album. <laughs> so, now... I'm not saying it's a good album, um, but it was uh, a valuable one. So, where are we going to go forward, or where am I going to go forward from here? And I, I, I don't know, but I think the answer to that is looking backward. You know, I think uh, I still want to be a puppeteer, and I want to make movies, and I want to take more photos. I want to create a video game, and make more apps, and websites, and I don't know what else just came up. Art, yeah, I want to make art. Um, I should really update my blog. Uh, I should learn CSS and cook. I really want to get beefy. Um, and I want to ride more. So, you know, it, it, it's funny saying it, I do as little as possible. I really want to do as much as possible. And I know we're running low on time, and I know that was a lot. But in summation, here's 12 things that I just talked about. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to kind of parse all of this stuff and make it meaningful, um, but maybe it, it, it can happen over time. But I think that by hearing stories uh, with each other, uh, we can achieve that. We can do these things. And, you know, a, a great way to start this, and it doesn't have to be I want to make a thing, but maybe I just have a problem that I want to work through, is to use design as your process. Um, to solve these challenges. So you identify what these problems are, whether you, you don't like your job or you don't like your shoes, I'm not sure what it is, but define what that thing is and then make solutions for it and then just repeat. And I thank you.